Good afternoon. Welcome to On the Legal Line. I'm Dennis Kennelly, your host, and we've got a really interesting show for you today dealing with two areas that I think are of interest to just about everybody. One is sexual harassment in the workplace. I'll be discussing that. And then a new and hot topic that just came up recently, and that is marijuana in the workplace. What does the uh, passage of Proposition 64 mean to companies and employees concerning employees' use of marijuana, either outside the job or on the job? And we'll be dealing with that in the second half of the show. We've got sexual harassment in the first half, but first, we want to take a look at what's going on nationally, what's the top news in the legal field. And today, it is our Attorney General, Jeff Sessions. The newly confirmed Attorney General is the subject of a lot of controversy right now. I think all of you are having a better day than he is, believe me. If you have not been awake for the last 24 hours, just to summarize what's going on, Mr. Sessions, as the Attorney General, has been tasked by President Trump with launching an investigation into the possible Russian influence in the last presidential election. During his confirmation hearings, he answered a written question as to whether he had ever met with any Russian officials and discussed the, any election-related issues. Uh, he answered very briefly. This was a written question posed to him but I, by, I think, Senator Al Franken of Minnesota. And his answer was no. Was that the technically right answer to the question? Yes, it was. But it now comes out that he has met on two, had met on two occasions with representatives of the Russian government specifically the Russian ambassador to the United States. Now, the position of Russian ambassador to the United States is not a ceremonial position. People in that particular role in Russia, when they come over here, are not only diplomats, but likely also members of the SF FSB, which is the successor to the KGB, which is the Russian intelligence service. Some may think of him as the Russian chief spy in the United States. So, did Senator Sw Sessions answer the question correctly? The answer is, of course, yes, he did. He was technically right. What would you or I have done in that circumstance? Well, politically, what I hope we would have done is say, I have never discussed any election issues with any Russian officials, but I have on two occasions met with them in the past prior to the campaign, prior to the election. That would have quelled the entire controversy. Now, just as a sidelight, one of the meetings with the Russian ambassador took place in Cleveland at the time, the Democratic National, excuse me, the Republican National Convention was being held in that city. Now, it does strain credulity quite a bit to think that the parties had a meeting there and did not address the election. Uh, may have been true, but to me personally, it seems highly unlikely. So I think there's more to follow. I think there'll be more drilling down on this. Uh, the controversy is spanning both political parties. It's not only the Democrats. The Democrats want Sessions to resign, which is predictable. But what is not predictable is the reaction he's getting from his own side of the aisle, his former Senate and House colleagues, who are saying, what we want you to do is recuse yourself from this investigation because you're too close to it. Actually, his meetings would likely be part of it. And asking President Trump to appoint a special prosecutor who's independent who would look into that. From the Republican standpoint, that would seem to be the better bet. But Trump, at least to date, 
is supporting Sessions. So it will be interesting to see how it plays out. And I think the last thing that Mr. Trump needs at this stage is a fight with his own party in Congress. That's not going to help his agenda today as as we speak. He is uh, speaking on the USS Gerald Ford, a the country's newest aircraft carrier, which has not yet been commissioned in Newport News, Virginia. So keep your eyes on that going forward. Now, why is that part of on the legal line? Well, Jeff Sessions, as the Attorney General of the United States, is the country's chief law enforcement officer. So, and the Democrats, obviously, are saying at some level they're accusing him of perjury, which I, as a lawyer, I don't think. I've prosecuted perjury cases in the past and defended them. And I don't think what he did constituted perjury. What I do think is that it was politically inappropriate. He should have been more forthcoming. As you know, this show is our show. It's about you. It's about me. It's about what you want to talk about, what legal issues you have. And the way to get in contact with us is very simple. Phone number is 661-298-5487. 661-298-5487. If you want to get on Facebook and watch us, it's we're streaming live on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash K-H-T-S-A-M, and the email is Dennis at hometownstation.com. So try any one of those vehicles, and we'll be happy to answer your question. As I've said in the past, feel free to contact us during the week, and we'll be dealing with your questions. And now we're going to move on to the area of sexual harassment, which is always always an interesting topic for discussion, and specifically sexual harassment in the workplace. And we'll start with what is it? What kind kind of stuff is it? Well, there are basically two types of it. One is very simple, or would seem to be very simple to understand, and that's called quid pro quo sexual harassment. What that involves is your supervisor or a manager coming to you and saying, excuse me, I really think you're attractive. Uh, I'm in a hiring process right now. Uh, Let's go to dinner tonight, and uh, then let's go somewhere else afterwards and engage in some kind of sexual activity. Uh, That is blatant sexual harassment. It is impermissible, and it rarely happens anymore. Uh, People have become far more sophisticated about dealing with it. Uh, The tough ones are on the quid pro quo area, the borderline ones. If your supervisor is asking you to do things that you feel uncomfortable doing, but because he or she is your supervisor, You're doing it for fear of some sort of retaliation, uh, some sort of implied threat that uh, things on the job are going to change uh, if you don't engage in what they're asking. Very simply, your supervisor asks you to dinner. Uh, You're single, he's single. Uh, You're not particularly attracted to him or, or her. It can go either way. And yet, you feel you should do it. I mean, I had a case many, many years ago where a supervisor kept telling an employee, uh, and these are words, if you're a supervisor, you never want to utter. I shouldn't feel this way about you, but I think you're awfully attractive, etc., etc., etc. This This individual would then plan business trips and he would find out that the employee in question was traveling to a site. He was in a position, he was one of the top officers of the company, and he would arrange to go to the same site 
He would book himself into first class and pay to upgrade the employee, alleging that they had to discuss business on the flight. And guess what? He would spend the entire flight staring at her <laughs> and discussing no business. And that, that was not cool. Uh, and it wound up in a retaliatory environment. Uh, the individual uh, was in a position where she was, every day she stayed on the job, she wound up collecting a whole bunch of stock options, which were at a very favorable price. And with that, uh, she couldn't afford, she couldn't afford to leave the job. She worked in this environment for a year before she finally said to me and made, God knows how much money uh, from the uh, from the stock options, and she finally said to me, "I can't take it anymore." And we wound up settling that case for an inordinately amount, high amount of money. And uh, the harassment never really got physical. It was just that was it was implied quid pro quo because of the guy's position. And it was a hostile environment because no one should have to work in an environment where they feel uncomfortable. They're being asked to do things that they don't want to do, that they ordinarily wouldn't, wouldn't want to do. So quid pro quo, if you're an employee and if you feel uncomfortable when a supervisor, supervisor or a company manager ask you to do something, have a talk with them. I mean, it takes a lot of guts. It really does. But the best way to deal with these things are nip them in the bud early uh, so that you don't find yourself in a position down the road where you really find yourself signing up to do things that you're not comfortable doing at all. So that's, that's one kind of sexual harassment. The other kind is host a hostile work environment. And that means that you know, one of your co-workers is constantly, one of your co-workers to whom you're not attracted is saying things, making comments about your looks, making com asking you out, making comments about how you dress, how attractive you look. And here is a key factor. And you have told him that these make you uncomfortable and they are not, uh, they are not welcome. One of the key factors in sexual harassment is letting the individual know that their conduct is not welcomed by you. Uh, because if you don't tell them, it's going to be the it's going to be very hard if you ever get to a lawsuit to let these pe to contend that this was sexual harassment because if the employee or the co-worker or the supervisor didn't know it was unwelcome, uh, that's a good defense for the company. So if you're a company representative, one of the key things here is figuring out what the company's responsibilities are. What happens, what happens if one of your employees comes to you and says, I'm being harassed on the job. I feel that the actions of X in continuing to ask me out after I've told him I don't want to go out with him or her are constituting sexual harassment. I want the company to do, do something about it. Well, what the employee should do even before he or she goes to management and says, I have a problem, is to read the company's sexual harassment policy. By law, in California, companies are obligated to have a policy dealing with sexual harassment. What, they should be, what it should be saying is, what you do if you feel harassed and what the company's responsibilities are. 
Because if the company has a, quali a qualified policy in place, and the laws are quite clear on that, and in another show we'll go into greater detail uh, on what the employer's responsibilities are, how these policies should be written, what they should cover, uh, who should do the investigation. Clearly these policies have to include a no retaliation clause because no policy is worth its salt if an employee feels that if he or she complains, they're subject to retaliation. Because just about every sexual harassment claim you see now in the courts, and there are still quite a few of them, also involves a claim for retaliation. Because uh, sexual harassment is one of these things companies would like to have a sexual harassment-free environment, but it is a pain in the neck to enforce it. And it takes a lot of human resources time. You hope people are wise enough and civil enough to act in a manner that is not sexually harassing, but the human condition being what it is, they don't. Now, for the harassment to be legally sufficient to constitute sexual harassment, it's got to be severe and pervasive. Now, if you keep getting asked out by the same individual after you've told them to stop, that would likely qualify. He probably gets the first two for free, but after that it becomes harassment. Similarly, the, the, the comments about your looks, how you're dressed, how your hair looks. Once you've told them, told somebody that they're unwelcome, they better watch what they're doing. So what do you do if you're harassed? Where do you go? Well, the first place you go is you read the company's sexual harassment policy and figure out what you're supposed to do there. Who you talk to about it. Who you see. What you tell them. And then you ask them, what are they going to do about it? Because what you want, you're not looking for money at that point. What you're looking for is you want it to stop. You want to be able to go to work and live in a harassment-free environment. Here's a uh, copy from Lena in Fillmore uh, that we got a Twitter question. And the question is, what's the time limit that you can file a sexual harassment charge. Okay, where, first of all, if you're going to file, file with the company, do it immediately. Uh, but you darn well better do it within a year. But I would say as quickly as possible. Now, legally speaking, what you have to do is you have to notify the State Department of Fair Employment and Housing within a year of the last activity of sexual harassment, the last example of it, uh, so that if it's been a two-year pattern, your time starts to run when the last incident occurred. But you darn well better have notified the company, or the company's going to say, excuse us, we'd have done something about it, but we didn't know. How can we fix something that we didn't know about? So you have to put the company on notice. And you've got to follow up. You can't just write a written complaint and sit back. You've got to follow up with it. And you darn well better make sure that they've got a good sexual harassment. Uh, and most importantly, after you've complained, no retaliation provision. As it turns out, we're just scratching the surface of sexual harassment. Uh, but we've got a guest lined up, Leslie Wallace, who is a very, very qualified employment lawyer from Los Angeles. She represents management, and she and I are going to talk about marijuana in the workplace. Now that marijuana is legal under California law, what effect does it have on employees' rights and responsibilities in the workplace? We're going to be talking about, <coughs> excuse me, what about company policies on marijuana use and drug testing? When can companies test for cause? 
When is drug te- random drug testing permissible? Since marijuana is, quote, legal in California now, can you show up on the job in an impaired condition? I think we know the answer to that one. Uh, tune in after the break, and uh, we'll have more with Leslie Wallace on marijuana in the workplace.